morning again. Um, I wonder if you've ever heard people say that money is the root of all evil and, and them say that the Bible says that money is the root of all evil. Well, the Bible, of course, doesn't say that. The Bible says this. The Bible says that the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. The love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It goes on to say, some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. That's the bit in the the orangey text on the screen. The Christian view on possessions is that everything good that we have comes to us as a gift from God. It's a gift from God and we should be content with what God gives us. And so if you look at the first words on the screen, it actually says this, godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. We should be content with what God gives us. And actually, we should be generous with the things that we've received. So the Bible doesn't condemn money as wrong. The Bible doesn't condemn riches as wrong. The Bible condemns the kind of pursuit of riches where we're set on getting money. And that defines us as the thing, one of the things that will destroy our souls. The love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Now, as I say those words, you may think, are we having a week off Nehemiah and just having a sort of sermon on money? Well, no, we are still in Nehemiah, but if we can get hold of that truth, we'll see what's gone wrong in this chapter today. The love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, and God's people are called to live differently. We are people who've been shown mercy, we've been shown generosity, And therefore, we're called to mirror our God, to reflect our God. We're called to be generous. And so that's what we're thinking about today. We're called to be generous. Now, just to recap uh, what we've done uh, over previous weeks, for those of you who weren't here or perhaps were sleepy in other weeks, um, the book of Nehemiah narrates uh, narrates the final part of the Old Testament history. So after Nehemiah, there are some more books in the Bible, but there's nothing more about Israel's history. After that, it's straight to Jesus. Um, so there's 400 year, this is 400 years before Jesus, and the city of Jerusalem had been destroyed. Uh, as a, God had allowed that as a way of disciplining his people, um, and they were destroyed by a group called the Babylonians. They were then overtaken by a group called the Persians, and a Persian king actually allowed people to go back and rebuild their cities, rebuild their land. So lots of Jews did go back. They rebuilt the, the city of Jerusalem in, in some parts. Um, they rebuilt the, the temple. And so you read all about that stuff in the book of Ezra. Um, but by the time of Nehemiah, things still weren't complete. And so Nehemiah, the book of Nehemiah, at least the chapters we've looked at so far, are kind of his memory, his memoirs of, of what went on. Uh, for him. He discovered that the city walls were still broken and that meant that they were pretty vulnerable. And so he was heartbroken about this and he he just weeps. He weeps and weeps and weeps and prays and prays and prays. cries out to God. So that's chapter one. Uh, Then chapter two, he approaches the, 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 uh, the king of Persia and says, my people are Uh, still not in a good place. The city walls are are broken. I want to go back, and I ask you, would you support me? Would you give me supplies? And amazingly, the the king did that. So Nehemiah is able to set off, um, and he does. Chapter 3, he gathers lots of people around him to rebuild, uh, all kinds of people helping out. And then chapter 4, we see that there's some people trying to hinder this work. Um, That's what Keith preached about last week, and what we thought about even in the kids' talks. And kind of bullies, really, making fun of them for the work they were doing, which brings us up to chapter 5, which is what we're looking at today. And chapter 5 shows us that all is not well within the Jewish camp. So we saw some opposition last week from from some sort of outsiders, but actually uh, the, the problem today is fellow Jews who should have known better. If you read chapter 3, you see this wonderful unified vision of everybody building and everything's great, but just a bit later, there was division had crept in. Have you ever noticed that? If you've ever seen uh, sort of demonstrations of unity, have you noticed how it's not long after that that often disunity comes in? 
Why is that? Well, it's because the human heart is so prone towards selfishness. And that's what's going on in chapter 5, that the people are selfish. And the way it shows up is by the rich exploiting the poor. So this is Jew and Jew side by side who should be focused on God's mission. Let's get the wall complete. Let's look out for each other as we do that. But actually, some were making money and others were in extreme poverty. And so God's own people were causing harm to each other by failing to show mercy, failing to show generosity, failing to show compassion. Uh, And as we work through this text, there's three things I want us to to see as we work through it uh, that kind of helps us see the kind of flow of this narrative passage. So firstly, uh, in verses 1 to 5, we see godless behavior. Uh, I put in bracket selfishness. The root of godless behavior is always selfishness says this, now the men and their wives raised a great outcry against their fellow Jews. Some were saying, we and our sons and daughters are numerous. In order for us to eat and stay alive, we must get grain. Others were saying, we are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards and our homes to get grain during the famine. Still others were saying, we have had to borrow money to pay the king's tax on our fields and vineyards. Although we're of the same flesh and blood as our fellow Jews, and though our children are as good as theirs, Yet we've had to subject our sons and daughters to slavery. Some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but we are powerless because our fields and our vineyards belong to others. So what's going on here? Well, uh, there's an outcry. The men and the wives, they're, they're crying out, saying something's wrong. Something's wrong. What's wrong? Well, this was a period of famine and a period, therefore, of, of some poverty And lots of people had left their fields to go and work on the wall. They were committed to God's mission and often had to neglect some of their work back home. Uh, And so uh, they they became poor. They weren't getting the food that they needed and they started to have to mortgage some of their fields. And so they were uh, then not getting the resources that they should have had. Um, And some of their Jews were heavily taxing them. They were making money from this bad situation. So those Jews who had a bit more should have been looking out for those who were suffering, but rather than that, they were taxing them hard. They were mortgaging them hard. And on top of that, they they had the king's taxes to pay. And so this was really tough economically. High mortgages, tax that seems too high, feels a bit like modern culture, doesn't it? um, but, But that's what's going on. And so you've got this extreme poverty to the extent that some are so poor... They're so poor that they're having to sell their sons and daughters into slavery. Can you imagine this? This is a historical book. This isn't a sort of f- fictitious book. This is, um, this is true, a true story where people were so poor that they had to sell their sons and daughters into slavery. I mean, is poverty beyond what any one of us in this room has imagined? We, we may, some, of us, some of you may feel that you don't have much, but actually, to get to that point where you have to sell your kids into slavery, this is, this is gut-wrenching. I mean, feel the, the, the pain of this, the anguish of this. They're crying out, look, we're selling our children into slavery. And the worst part of all of this is that it was God's people doing it to God's people which is so offensive to God. God God had made it clear time and time again in his words that God's people are called to be a generous people. Let me give you one example. This one. It says this. If any of you, any of your fellow Israelites become poor and are unable to support themselves among you, help them as you would a foreigner and a stranger so that they can continue to live among you. Do not take interest or any profit from them, but fear your gods so that they may continue to live among you. You must not lend money to them at interest or sell them food at profit. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan and to be your God. So this comes way before Nehemiah and it's God saying, you do not charge interest to your own people. You look out for your own people. You care for the well-being of your own people. It goes on to say, don't take your own people into slavery. The Jews, God's people, were meant to be a people of love, a people of generosity. And if they failed to to live generously, actually what they were doing was failing to fear God, failing to revere God. And do you notice God roots their calling to be generous in the fact that he has been gracious to them. He took them out of Egypt. He took them out of Egypt. He gave them a land. He made them his people. 
he became their God. God was so generous to them, and so the people of God were called to be generous because God had first been generous to them. You know, sometimes people say, I don't really like the God of the Old Testament. Well, I kind of wonder, what what are you talking about? Read this stuff. This is God saying, treat the poor kindly. I'm the God who has shown grace to you. I want you to show grace to other people. It's a beautiful image. If people lived by this, then the world would be a different place. God says, don't be greedy. Contentment is what we're called to have. But in Nehemiah's time, this simply wasn't happening. The people were saying, look, we're being destroyed by the rich. They're they're just taking advantage of us, and we're absolutely desperate. That's the situation. So how does Nehemiah respond to this godliness? Well, he responds with a godly response. Uh, And really, the calling is towards repentance. He calls them back, come back to God. Come back and live as God would have you live. This is verses 6 to 13. When I heard their outcry, 6 to 11 first of all, but we're going to look at 6 to 13. When I heard their outcry and these charges, I was very angry. I pondered them in my mind and then accused the nobles and officials. I told them, you are charging your own people interest. So I called together a large meeting to deal with them and said, as far as possible, we have brought back our fellow Jews who were sold to the Gentiles. Now you are selling your own people only for them to be sold back to us. They kept quiet because they they couldn't find anything to say. So I continued, what you're doing is not right. Shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God to avoid the reproach of our Gentile enemies? I and my brothers and my men are also lending money to people and grain, but let us stop charging interest. Give back to them immediately their fields, their vineyards, olive groves and houses, and also the interest you're charging them. 1% of the money, grain, new wine, and olive oil. What's his reaction to this? His reaction is anger. Anger. Nehemiah is angry. Why is he angry? Because he knows and loves God's words. We've just seen what God calls his people to do, and they're not doing it. And so he's angry, and he's right to be angry. Those wealthy nobles and officials were taking too much money. Money had become their idols. Do you remember that verse at the beginning? The love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. These guys love money, and he's angry. And anger is a a hugely appropriate response to this situation. We we should get angry at injustice. Did you know that? That There are some things we should be angry about. If If we're apathetic to injustice, then something is wrong. Something should be stirred in us when people are mistreated. There is a righteous indignation... And righteous indignation cares about the glory of God and the good of people. So if we have a concern for the glory of God and the good of people, at times we will be provoked in our spirit by things that aren't right. The key question with anger of any kind, whether it's righteous or not, is what do you do with it? What do you do with it? And I think so often with anger, we go from angry... And we often feel it's justified, even if it isn't. But we go from anger to action, don't we? That's that's often the the process. You're feeling angry and you respond. Notice what he does, verse 7. When he turns his indignation into contemplation, he thinks through his anger. Look at verse 7. When I heard their outcry and these charges, I was very angry. What does he say then? I pondered them in my mind. I pondered them in my mind. Or if you've got an ESV, I think it says something like, I took counsel with myself. He's speaking to himself. So he's feeling angry, and before he does anything, he's talking to himself. And that's a sort of half a verse, but I don't think that's a a five-second process. He's angry, and he's thinking. He's talking to himself. What do I do? What do I do? Where do I go from here? I'm sure he brings God into the picture. God, what do you want me to do? So key, when we go from, if we've got an anger, if we've got an indignation, don't go straight to action, go to that contemplation first. What am I meant to do here? What's my response here? Because we need to learn from this. We need to process our anger before we act because we can all be impulsive, can't we? We can act before we've really had time to think and process. And, and, and that's more true today than any other time in history, I think, because we've got such instant communication. You know, you get an email, boom, you want to reply. You get a text message, you want to go passive-aggressive. Or whatever it is, we can, we can reply really fast. But actually, there's so much wisdom in just holding back. If you want to write that email, write that email if it's therapeutic. But don't click send until you've left it 24 hours and think, 
hand on heart before God, I think this is a good idea. That, that's what he does. He processes his anger, and therefore he's able to act. And, and he does act. God does call us to act at times, and he does, and he basically confronts them. So he's gone from indignation to contemplation to action, and his action is one of confrontation. And he basically tells them, off, look, what you guys have done is wrong. It's wrong. You can't defend this. This goes against God. Is there, is there no fear of God in you? He's telling them off. He's telling them off. There's no fear of God in you. How does this appear to the onlooking nations, he says? You know, Israel was meant to be a light to the nations. People were meant to come to Israel and say, there is something different about the people of God. They are not selfish. They are a generous people. And when asked why you are generous people, they can point back and say, well, we worship a generous God. But they're not doing that. And there's, there's something here for us, isn't there? We're called to be different. We're called to be different. We're called to be generous. We're, we're called to be God's hands and feet here on earth. Because the reality is that most people who don't know anything about Christianity, their, their perception of Christianity is formed by Christians, isn't it? So if, if they come across Christians and Christians are mean and stingy, then, then that's their view of God. Why would you want anything to do with that God if he's mean and stingy? But if Christians are generous and warm and loving and positive, then they're going to say, well, what is it about your God? And the people in Nehemiah's time were not living as they should, and so the onlooking nations are not going to say, we want to worship this God. And we need to learn from that too. We need to be generous and positive and and having something, showing to have something that other people may want. And as Nehemiah confronts this situation, he he remains humble because he doesn't... He says even about himself, look, we've been taking money too. I, I don't know whether he charged interest, he doesn't actually say that, but he, he kind of includes himself in a way, and such a helpful way to lead, isn't it, where he doesn't come across as smug. Look, we, we all need to do the right thing here, he says. We need to stop charging interest. We need to treat people well. And this is how they responded, verse 12. We, they, then they said, we will restore these things and require nothing from them. We will do as you say. This is repentance. This is a turning round. They're exploiting people. He says it's time to stop. They say, we're going to stop. We're going to stop. And how does it continue? Then I summoned the priests and made the nobles and officials take an oath to do what they'd promised. I also shook out the folds of my robe and said, in this way, may God shake out their house, of their house and possessions, anyone who does not keep the promise. So may such a person be shaken out and emptied. Uh, At this, the whole assembly said, amen, and praised the Lord. And the people did as they had promised. So he said, look, you guys need to stop. You need to stop treating people badly. They say, you're right, we need to stop treating people badly. He says, bring on the priests and let them swear before the priests. We're going to treat people well. Then he does a little object lesson. He shakes out the folds from his his garment and he says, look, if anyone fails to treat people well, may God shake you out. You need to treat people well, he says. And the people say amen and praise the Lord. I love that. I, I love it when people say amen and praise the Lord. Maybe you've been uh, in churches where, where they do that. I was in an international church before, and lots of people used to do that in the middle of a sermon, in the middle of a prayer. Amen, praise the Lord. And if you're from churches that do that, do it, because I love it. I love it. Um, can I get an amen? amen? There we go. Thank you, Ryan. Bless you. Praise the Lord. Um, So yeah, amen and praise the Lord. That's what he says. There's a a godly response here, a godly response. They're turning their back on sin and turning their face towards God, which is what repentance is. Sin is when our backs are towards God and our face is towards sin. Repentance, we turn around, face towards God, back towards sin. That's their godly response. The final thing I want us to think about is, is that there's a godly example, a godly example here We're looking at verses 14 to 19. Verses 14 to 19. Nehemiah is not just a leader that yells out instructions. He's a man who who lives as an example. he's, He's a teacher to them. He's a governor to them. But actually, he leads by example. We see that so frequently, and we see it in verses 14 to 19. Moreover, from the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when I was appointed to be the governor in the land of Judah until his 32nd year, which was a 12-year period he served as governor, neither I nor my brothers ate the food allotted to the governor. 
But the earlier governors, those preceding me, placed a heavy burden on the people and took 40 shekels of silver from them in addition to food and wine. Their assistants also lorded it over the people, but out of reverence for God, I did not act like that. Instead, I devoted myself to the work on the wall. All my men were assembled there for the work. We did not acquire any land. Furthermore, 150 Jews and officials ate at my table, as well as those who came to us from the surrounding nations. Each day, one ox, six choice sheep, and some poultry were prepared for me, and every 10 days, an abundant supply of wine of all kinds. In spite of this, I never demanded the food allotted to the governor, because the demands were heavy on these people. Remember me with favour, my God, for all that I've done for these people. So Nehemiah was appointed to be the governor of these people, and for 12 years, he forsook uh, some of the bonuses he could have got. As, as the governor of Judah, he could have lived like a king. I mean, he does live well anyway, we see that at the end. But he could have had all kinds of benefits, but he forsook them because he didn't want to exploit the people. And, and it, it uses there the language of earlier governors uh, being sort of lording over people. But, but Nehemiah's view of leadership is not lordship. It's not lordship. He, he's a servant leader. You know, those governors prior to him were living in luxury while the people lived in poverty. And he was, they were just taking more and more from the people. And he says, I don't, I don't want to live like that. I, want, I don't want to take more from these people. Uh, amazing kindness and generosity. Um, and, and he doesn't just not take from people. He's also extremely generous. He says that he had 150 Jews and officials, along with others from the surrounding nations, come and eat with him. I mean, that's a lot of people to eat at your table, isn't it? 150 people. That was a big table. Um, who knows how you fit it in, but he had 150 come and dine with him. And they didn't eat poorly. They ate all kinds of great food, and they had lots of wine. And he was a wine taster, so I reckon he knew a good bottle of wine when he found it. So these guys were, were, were enjoying things. God's view of money, as I said earlier, he's not anti-money, so we can enjoy things. He, he, he enables us, he gives us things to enjoy, but never at the expense of, of mistreating other people. We're called to be generous. And, and Nehemiah's got such a generous heart, such a generous heart. And in verse 19 there at the bottom, we see the motive. Remember me with favour, my God, for all that I have done for these people. Nehemiah cared about glorifying God by loving people. Glorifying God by loving people. That's our calling in life. Glorify God by loving people. And as I said earlier, the, the, the root for the, the calling to love is rooted in the fact that God has first loved us. When God says, look, you don't charge interest to people, you treat people well, he first of all said, look, I took you out of Egypt. I've given you a land. I've given you so much. Therefore, show kindness to others. And friends, we're, we're a new covenant people. We've been given the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. God didn't spare his son for us. He's given us a, a redemption so much greater than the one out of Egypt. We're, we're, we're children of the living God through the shed blood of Jesus. The generosity of the Father towards us is beyond anything that has ever been done in human history. We read this in 2 Corinthians. Uh, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich... Yet for our sake, he became poor, so that you through his poverty may become rich. Isn't that wonderful? The Lord Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, who reigned eternally with his father, came as a servant, died on a cross, took the worst form of death. He became poor. Why? So that we may know the living God, that we might be in right relationship with the living God. All of our sin nailed upon him. He didn't have to do that. He did that because he's extraordinarily merciful extraordinarily generous. And he says, anyone who receives this gift of what he's done, his generosity is made right with God forever and has eternal riches. He who did not spare his own son, will he not give us all things, it says in God's word. He's a generous God, a generous God who offers eternal life to each one of us. How do we get this eternal life? Well, let's think about our sermon today, godless behaviour. We recognise, do you know what? Actually, I'm guilty of godless behaviour. My heart is prone towards self-centredness. Even the things that I think might be good about myself, they're tainted by sin, actually. I'm a sinner. I need to recognise that. I recognise that by owning it, by admitting it, and say, do you know what? I don't want to live that way anymore. I want to receive the mercy of Jesus, be made right with God. 
And when I am, I'm accepted by God. There's a no condemnation a verdict pronounced over me. And friends, if you've never made that step of following Jesus, that is the first thing you need to do. He loves you. He's given uh, his life for you. And anyone who puts their trust in him will live forever with God. That's the promise. And for those of us who have, friends, we need to be marked out by generosity. We, we've been given so much. How can we not give? How can we not show love? When people meet us, they should say, do you know what? He's such a kind guy. She's such a generous lady. They're, they're such a hospitable family. We, we need to show the generosity of God to those that we meet. And so uh, as we come towards the, a close, I'm just going to leave a minute's silence, actually. And in that minute, I want you to think, if you're not a Christian or you've never, yeah, never made a response to Jesus, think through the offer that he has for you of eternal life through his death. And if you are a Christian, I want you to think, in the coming week, how can I show generosity to someone? Like, think of one practical thing, so that when you walk through these doors next week, you can look back, not with any pride at all, because it's all gift, isn't it? We're just giving back what God's given us. But when you come through the doors next week, you can look back and think, do you know what, I did something generous to bless someone else. Think of something concrete that you can do this week. You don't need to tell anyone, keep it in your own heart, but bless someone this week and work out today what you're going to do to be generous to someone else. So I'm going to leave a minute for us to think about those things and then I'm going to pray and then we'll sing after that. Our Father in heaven, you are an extraordinarily generous God. You're a God who took a people who were in slavery and took them out of that slavery, leading them through waters through an extraordinary miracle in an event called the Exodus. But Lord, for us, wow, the salvation we have is infinitely greater. The fact that you did not spare your son but gave him for us means we have an inheritance that is just beyond anything that we can even begin to imagine. Lord, we're sorry, because actually we lose sight of that. We get bogged down by things that shouldn't bog us down. Uh, we should keep our eyes on you and your extraordinary grace to us. Lord, may this grace thrill us. May it cause us to be transformed. And may we therefore be generous. Lord, what kind of reaction is it if we say yes to a God who offers us the gift of his son, but then we're not really changed by it, Lord. It's not, it's not the reward, it's not the recognition, it's not the thankfulness that should be given, Lord. We should be changed. We should be changed by the fact that you've given us your son, and we too should be a generous people. So we ask that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you might make each one of us generous and cause us to look for ways that we can bless other people. I thank you for this body of people who I know <laughs> are so generous. Even the existence of this church is due to the generosity of so many in this room, giving so regularly, so faithful. May we continue to, to grow in this. May we be people who see needs of others and bless other people. And we pray all these things in the name and for the glory of our great Saviour, who for our sake became poor, so that we may become rich, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's stand.